de soledad con mi familia quisiera estar ya conocí la tristeza el llanto, el odio, el racismo pobreza, se para amargura desprecio, maltrato, más nunca más nunca la libertad ya conocí la tristeza, el llanto, el odio el racismo, pobreza, se para amargura, desprecio, maltrato más nunca más nunca la libertad If you have uh, yet to find a seat, please uh, move forward and uh, occupy the seats in the front. Thank you. All right. Hello, everyone. Thank you all so much for being here and welcome to the People Over Profit Health as a Human Right Across the World panel. Um, thank you all so much for joining us here today for in this historic People's Summit of Democracy in Los Angeles. Before I get started, I do want to mention that we have um, interp interpretation devices for anyone who is not bilingual. Anyone can go ahead and access it. You can find it right outside this room. So, um, the People's Summit is a space to uplift and dialogue with the many voices of those who work toward a new reality where true people's democracy comes first and who represent the interests of the majority of the people in the Americas. We are facing multiple crises across the region driven by policies that put profit first. The people who live and work every day in these conditions, who make society run and make life possible, are the ones who can build the solutions to these crises. The United States, where 140 million people face poverty, where 1 million people have died of COVID-19, 2 million people are incarcerated. This is not a model for democracy. We cannot allow the U.S. elite to define democracy for us and to impose their definition of democracy on other sovereign nations. We need to build a democracy that serves the people. And to do that, we need to meet, dialogue, debate, exchange, and work together across borders. The People Summit is a space to uplift and dialogue the many voices of those who work towards a new reality, where true people's democracy comes first and solutions are curated for the people, by the people. It would be remiss to not mention the exclusion of Cuba, as you all have heard today, of Venezuela, of Nicaragua, from the summit of the Americas, which has already made it a failure even before it began and sparked a widespread boycott across the Americas. The summit of the Americas exclusion shows the true interest um, of of the summit of the Americas, that is to serve the U.S. government's interests in the region. There is no Americas without Cuba. 23 members of Cuban civil society who were invited to attend um, our People's Summit were denied visas. 
This delegation would have given us a chance to exchange directly with those who are developing COVID-19 vaccines, winning Olympic medals, leading the LGBTQ um, struggle, creating people's media, and the denial directly deprives us, especially young people, of a momentous opportunity. The denial of their, of their visas is an affront to democratic values, the same values that the U.S. pretends to uphold. The U.S. is threatened by the many advances that Cuban society has been able to uphold despite their 60 years of a brutal blockade and relentless attacks on their sovereignty. The U.S. does not want its young people to see that it is possible, that it is possible to build a society based on care for human life and that it is possible to build a democracy that works for the majority. Because they were denied visas, we are only able to have video messages from these um, representatives. So we will be hearing from um, Dr. Ramos, who is a um, medical doctor specializing in immunology. She graduated from the Superior Institute of Medical Sciences of Havana, and since 2004, she's a clinical research director of the Center of Molecular Immunology in Havana, Cuba. And she's also the senior faculty of the Superior, Superior Institute of Medical Sciences of Havana. Her main area of expertise consists of cancer immunotherapy, and her work has contributed to the registration in Cuba and abroad of a cancer vaccine and a monoclonal antibody for several different tumors. She's also a member of the IAP COVID-19 expert group. Can we showcase her video, please? Hello, my name is Tania Crombet Ramos. I'm, I am the medical director of the Center of Molecular Immunology. Thank you for the invitation to share our thoughts regarding health resilience and the role of science in confronting COVID-19 in Cuba. Firstly, I would like to start by saying that in Cuba, we had also a very complicated situation regarding COVID-19, since we had had more than 1 million cases. But fortunately, we can claim that more than 99% of the cases had recovered. I am very proud to say that this very high recovery rate is the consequence of an integrated work between the scientific institutions and the Ministry of Health. So we have a national protocol that was agreed in the Innovation Committee. In this national protocol, we had had several versions according to the state-of-the-art knowledge. And in this protocol, we use 27 Cuban drugs. And in total, we can claim that 85% of the Cuban COVID portfolio uh, were from the Cuban national industry. And indeed, because we did not have some of the American drugs on account of the blockade that were used uh, for the antiviral therapy of the anti-inflammatory therapy, we have to reprofile some of our drugs. And indeed, we treated all the PCR-confirmed patients with a uh, recombinant alpha interferon and provided that we use this uh, early therapy with alpha interferon, we can say that less than 2% of the cases progress to the severe state of the disease. So we have a very good control of the disease. And in total, we had had three drugs that were reprofiled to treat the hyperinflammation associated with COVID-19. Well, so we couldn't use the innovative drugs that were recently developed by the US, as I said before, as a consequence of the political blockade, but we succeeded in uh, having three drugs that were indeed two monoclonal antibodies and one a peptide with similar regulatory properties that were very efficacious in controlling the cytokine storm. So as a result of this national protocol, we can also say that we had a very low fatality rate. So the current, the cumulative fatality rate of Cuba is 0.77. That compares very favorably with other countries which are richer than us, including the U.S. So in addition, Cuba also has a very a reduced number of deaths per million people. For example, in the case of the U.S., 
they had 3,000 deaths per million people, while in Cuba we have 753 deaths per million inhabitants. So this is a very favorable uh, comparison. So Cuba has four times less deaths per million inhabitants. Provided we knew that it was going to be impossible to have access to the American vaccines for COVID-19 or the rest of the world, the vaccines provided that there is a large inequities between the rich countries and the poor countries on the vaccine distribution, we decided to develop our own vaccine candidates. So in total, Cuba developed five vaccine candidates, among which three of Three of them are already approved by the, our regulatory agency and some other agencies in the world. And we are very proud to claim that Cuba was the first country in the world to implement vaccinating, uh, vaccinating the children. So more than 2 million children in Cuba above two years old received our, some of the vaccines uh, developed in Cuba, while we also vaccinated the postpartum and pregnant women and the convalescent patient. And we have now a national strategy for administering the booster to the vulnerable population. So according to the international databases, Cuba has one of the highest percent of the vaccinated population. Indeed, we have 94% of the population that is vaccinated that compares very favorably with the the world vaccination rate, which is 66, and of course with the low-income countries, which is only 16%. So finally, we continue advancing as a demonstration of resilience. We have new protocols to treat COVID-19 patients with sequelae, and we have uh, clinical trials for respiratory, cardiovascular, or renal lesions after COVID-19. But in parallel, we continue advancing in our areas of our largest expertise, including Alzheimer's disease and cancer. And particularly, we are very proud and happy to continue the relationship with our counterpart in Buffalo, which is the Roswell Park Comprehensive Cancer Center. And we are now working together in two clinical trials, which are ongoing in, in New York, and patients with lung cancer, and also patients at high risk to have a lung cancer are, are receiving therapy with a Cuban drug. So we are very happy to continue the relationship with the scientific community and with the US people. Thank you very much. that Cuba was able to develop effective COVID-19 measures and even five vaccines despite the horrendous blockade imposed on it by the United States. So without further ado, I would like to um, get started and introduce our first um, panelist. Um, our first panelist is Dr. Anna Malinow, who spent decades working as a pediatrician with immigrant, refugee, and underserved children in Ohio, Texas, Pennsylvania, and California. She is the past president of Physicians for a National Health Program, co-founder of Healthcare for All Texas, and lead organizer for the National Single Pair. She has authored opinion pieces on how National Single Pair will improve patient care and bring us closer to social justice. She has been a speaker on healthcare reform and featured on national and international media. She recently re uh, retired as a professor of pediatrics from the University of California, San Francisco. Please welcome Dr. Malinow. Thank you. Thank you. Thank you, um, Samina, and um, thank you, Dr. Ramos, for all you do. Thank you to my fellow panelists. Uh, thank you all for coming here today and to the volunteers that uh, put this uh, summit together. Um, I think that they, they really um, deserve a round of applause. Thank you. So it's always good to be surrounded um, by people who are even more radical than I am because it just shows me I'm in the right room. So I'm so happy to be here. Um, I uh, am not a public speaker, so I will use notes, so please forgive me. <laughs> um, our panel is tasked with looking at how the richest country in the world values economic profit over well-being and how we are fighting the privatization of healthcare to ensure healthcare as a human right. 
but I'm struck by the term, the richest country in the world. By whose metrics, though? By the value of goods and services, or by infant mortality? By household income, or economic inequality? By our consumption, or infant mortality? So I'm no economist, but by any moral standard, I'm not sure we qualify as the richest country in the world. Um, I, <laughs> thank you. I, I practiced pediatrics for 30 years, and I can tell you that I have seen children end up in the intensive care unit because their parents could not afford an inhaler to treat their asthma. I have seen children hospitalized with a blood infection because their parents could not afford simple oral antibiotics. And I have seen families have to struggle with the, the idea of having to sell their family farm to pay for their child's insulin. These are some of the children I have taken care of in the richest country in the world. So the individual right to health care is comprised of eight principles, and I will name them, universal access, availability of health care infrastructure and services, acceptable and dignified care, equality and non-discrimination care, highest attainable quality, participation, transparency and access to information, and finally, accountability. The U.S. has voted for, agreed to, signed, and ratified several documents, including binding treaties, which provide health care as a human right. Yet, by these metrics, we fail miserably to provide the individual right to health care in this country. Now, compared to peer countries that do guarantee health care as a right, we outspend almost every one of them by twice as much. For this price, compared to peer countries, we can boast the highest percent of uninsured, the lowest life expectancy, worst maternal, infant, and neonatal mortality, more administrative costs, more expensive prescription drugs, and importantly, more obscene profits. Our malady is to think we are exceptional when really we are alone. Let's talk about what happens in a pandemic, in a country where the public health care system is chronically underfunded, intractable and embedded racism exists, and a profit health care system which prioritizes profit over need takes over. Well, as Samina said, one million people die, 400,000 of which are probably unnecessary, and for every death, nine individuals, nine people, including children, grieve. The risk of death for people of color is almost twice that of whites, made up of essential but expendable workers. Rural hospitals and small physician practices shudder, and paradoxically, healthcare workers are furloughed. Mm. Yeah. Meanwhile, the top three health insurance companies, United Healthcare, Anthem, and Humana, see their profits double. And the combined pre tax profits of Pfizer, BioNTech, and Moderna, much as we are thankful for their vaccines during a pandemic, are over $1,000 per second. Our system is not normal, and we should stop treating it as such. The urgency for a national health system during a pandemic couldn't be greater, but the urgency is felt not only by progressives, but by capitalists as well. There is palpable urgency in Washington not to pass legislation for a national health program to combat the pandemic, but rather to privatize what we have left of our publicly funded healthcare system, Medicare, and Medicaid as fast as possible. Now, I will focus on the privatization of Medicare, but note that profiteers are using the exact same playbook on Medicaid, which is the public program for the poor. And for young people here who think they are so <laughs> far away from Medicare not to really care, remember, if we privatize Medicare now, there won't be any Medicare for all left to fight for. The question is, 
Why the urgency by the Trump administration first and the Biden administration now to completely privatize Medicare? Now, I believe there are two reasons. First, 60% of Americans already support Medicare for all. This popularity is not lost on the capitalist class who are looking for ways to transfer this public good, Medicare, into private hands before Congress does anything foolish like pass Medicare for all. Second, the for-profit in medical industrial complex has tapped the private health insurance market dry and they're looking for a new consistent revenue stream and Medicare with its annual $1 trillion budget is the kind of revenue stream that keeps capitalists up at night. So on the one hand, we have Americans who say they want a national health program, and on the other hand, capitalists demanding their cut of public dollars. The question now becomes, who will win? Well, I'll tell you who's winning right now, and it's not the people. I hate to tell you. The profiteers are coming after Medicare, our trusted and beloved program for seniors and people with disabilities. Now, Half of Medicare is already privatized by commercial insurance plans called Medicare Advantage. The plans recruit healthy seniors, they avoid sick ones, create narrow networks, deny and delay care, and only spend 85 cents of every dollar on health care. They are making billions off Medicare. Now, the other half of Medicare is called traditional Medicare. It's public and it's not supposed to have any profiteering intermediaries. It is extremely cost effective. They spend 98 cents of every dollar goes to pay for health care. But the profiteers are not content with half of Medicare. They want all of it. And they found a very willing partner in the Trump administration, which inserted a, pro a for profit middleman known as direct contracting entities, also known as DCEs, like a Trojan horse inside traditional Medicare. DCEs are mostly investor-owned healthcare corporations straight out of Wall Street that are managing the care of seniors and people with disabilities, without their consent, by the way. Now, the Biden administration, instead of ending this terrible Trump program, changed the name from DCE to this aspirational reach, added the banner of equity, and expanded it. Now, make no mistake, the administration's aim is to privatize all of Medicare and most of Medicaid by 2030. Now, back to equity. The idea that corporations, which created inequality in the first place, that are, can ever achieve equity, is just insane. Our resources should be spent on programs that would really improve social determinants of health, such as a living wage, canceling student debt, abolishing the carceral system, protecting the environment, supporting unions, and of course, passing a national single payer bill. But that's not what we are asking. The imagination of the people in this country has been so stunted that all we can ask for are dental vis visits and cheap eyeglasses for seniors. When everyone, just about everyone on earth, has world-class comprehensive health care for all their people at lower costs, all we can possibly imagine is dental cleaning or state-level efforts to pass single payer. We cannot leave health care or any human right to the whim of states, just like Medicaid expansion that leaves out millions of poor people, just like abortion rights that jeopardizes the lives of women, or voting rights which threatens democracy. There is no incremental reform that can ease the nation step by step into a removal of the corporate insurance industry and other profiteers from health care. Private insurance and corporate profits must be removed from the system through national legislation. Now, our job is not only to educate, but to open people's imagination to what is possible and what is their right. Now, I will, I will close with um, what we've been doing. In, in the past nine months, National Single Payer, which is a new organization, Physicians for a National Health Program, and others 
launched a campaign to stop the privatization of traditional Medicare. We are working with seniors and retirees, you know, the habitual voters, to raise public awareness. We got over 100,000 people to sign a petition demanding an end to DCEs, brought on 300 grassroots organizations to our cause, and convinced the Congressional Progressive Caucus, such as it is, to include ending DCEs on its slate of executive actions for President Biden, who can end DCEs with a stroke of a pen. What I'm saying is that this is a winnable fight. I've been organizing for national single payer for decades, and I can tell you this much, we've never won so much ground as in the past nine months. We are going after the commercial insurance plans, the private equity firms, the venture capitalists privatizing traditional Medicare first, and then we'll go after the profiteers in Medicare Advantage. We must protect Medicare so that we can improve it and expand it to all. No more American exceptionalism. Let's, thank you. Let's join the nations around the world which have declared and have achieved healthcare as a human right. Thank you. Thank you, Dr. Malina, for um, describing how there is a push for privatization from our government despite Medicare and uh, single payer having widespread support in, um, in this country. And I want to highlight one thing she said, that our system is not normal. Our healthcare system with incredibly obscene costs is not normal. So we must say no to privatization of our health care, and we must fight for a system that puts people over profit. So for our next speaker, I would like to introduce uh, Bill McKibben. Um, he's an American environmentalist, author, and educator who has written extensively on the impact of global warming. His 1989 book, The End of Nature, is regarded as the first book for a general audience about climate change. He has opposed big oil pipeline projects like the Keystone XL and supported the fossil fuel divestment campaign. He founded the Third Act, a 60 and over organization for action on climate justice. He is also a co-founder of the climate campaign group 350.org. Currently, he is a Schumann Distinguished Scholar at Middlebury College. Please welcome Bill McKibben. Well. Thank you for that kind introduction, and what a pleasure to be with you and, and, and with this panel today. Normally, I talk about climate change because it is the most, the biggest thing that human beings have ever done, and by a large measure. But today, I'm going to talk about, since we're really focused here on public health, I'm going to talk about another dimension of the fossil fuel business and the ways that it impacts people even more directly than climate change. When we burn coal or gas or oil, we do produce the carbon dioxide that heats the planet. But we also produce particulate pollution, small particles of soot that get in people's lungs and kill them. We've known that this is a problem for a long time, but it's only in the last year that we finally have really good global epidemiological studies to tell us precisely how big a problem it is. And it turns out, the studies that came out last year uh, by teams from both sides of the Atlantic, that about nine million human beings a year die from breathing the combustion byproducts of fossil fuel. Nine million, to give you some frame of reference, is a lot. That's about one death in five on this planet. It's more than COVID, HIV AIDS, malaria, TB, war, and terrorism combined, okay? So one death in five, and those deaths are concentrated, of course, among the poorest and most vulnerable people. You know who gets to live next to the highway, you know who gets to live next to the power plant. You understand why asthma rates are two and three times as high among African American communities. The same thing is true in every country on earth. That's, 
So that's the first thing to understand. One death in five we're talking about. Only cancer and heart disease, depending on how you measure them, are on, of the same magnitude in terms of killing people. But cancer and heart disease are hard to solve. Second point about all this, those nine million deaths are now unnecessary. We do not need any longer to be burning coal and gas and oil because engineers and scientists have done a remarkable job over the last two decades in bringing down the cost of solar power and wind power and the batteries to store that power. It's now the cheapest power on Earth and by a large and increasing margin, which means that there is no financial or technological obstacle at this point to rapidly replacing coal and gas and oil. We could end the 200,000 year human career of setting things on fire, okay? It's served us well, but it no longer is serving us well and we do not need it, all right? That leaves us to point three and here we're getting closer to the questions around profit. If we have an enormous problem, nine million people dead is an enormous problem, even before you take into account the fact that we're also melting the Arctic and raising the ocean and everything else, and we have a solution, renewable energy, why are we not pursuing that at an all-out breakneck pace? Why are we doing anything else in this world? Why is this not our job as governments, as citizens, full-time now, trying to spread as quickly as we can clean energy? Well, the answer to that is sad and obvious. There are people who make money selling coal and gas and oil, and they are unwilling to stop selling it. They are doing everything they can in every country in the world where this happens to hold on to their business model. So in our country, for instance, we finally have, thanks to great organizing by environmental justice advocates over the last decade, a more or less consensus within the Democratic Party that we should do something about this. And they finally put together a bill. Uh, 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 it wasn't the Green New Deal, but it was its cousin, this Build Back Better bill. And they got it as far as 49 votes in the US Senate. But it isn't passing and it isn't going to pass because of Senator Manchin from West Virginia who has taken more money from the fossil fuel industry than anybody else in Washington. Not an easy contest to win, but he won it, okay? That's what democracy is looking like at the moment right now. The ability of the fossil fuel industry to endlessly game our political system to maintain their business model past the point where we need it is the gravest danger that we face, which leads to point four, what do we do about it? We stand up to it and organize as fast and as hard as we can. Some of that organizing is directed at the government, but there are diminishing returns there for the reasons that I described. That system remains pretty well gamed in Washington and in many other places around the world. That means that we also need, and here I'm maybe being, uh, uh, well, th this is a room that should be able to deal with the r radicalism in this. This means that we need to take on also the financial forces behind fossil fuel. We need to be willing, in this case, to go after the capital in capitalism. The big banks that have, in the last seven years since the Paris Climate Accords, lent the fossil fuel industry more than a trillion dollars, allowing it to continue to expand. That banking system is producing that carbon, and in huge numbers. A study last week, two weeks ago, that I wrote about in The New Yorker demonstrated in numerical terms the size of that problem. It turns out that having money sitting around is the most dangerous thing that there could be for the atmosphere. So take a company like Google. It has a lot of money sitting around. 
it turns out that Google's money sitting around produces more carbon than all the products that they make and sell. Netflix's, net, the cash on hand in Netflix's bank account being lent out for pipelines and coal mines and fracking wells produces more carbon than all the billions of people streaming Netflix shows every night. Amazon gets, produces more carbon from its cash than it does from all its delivery vans and warehouses combined. We have to stand up to Chase Bank, Citibank, Wells Fargo, Bank of America. These are the four biggest banks in the country and the four biggest lenders on earth to the fossil fuel industry. It is not easy to stand up to them. See, they're, they're hard at work even now. Um, it is not easy to stand up to them because they are extraordinarily big. But they are also vulnerable if we organize. And that organizing has to come from lots of different places. At the moment, a lot of it's coming from young people who are doing terrific job, but they cannot do it alone because young people don't have enough money. People they don't have enough money for a lot of things, including this. Uh, people like me, people over the age of 60, have 70% of America's financial resources compared to about 5% for millennials. If we want those banks to take notice, we need older people engaged in this work as well, which is why we're organizing a third act and tell your parents and your grandparents about it. We've been having big demonstrations outside. The, my last trip before the pandemic was to get arrested at the Chase Bank in nearest the nation's capital in Washington, launching some of these campaigns. These fights continue. We've been outside banks all over America the last six months. It's often young people out front and behind them a crowd of older people. The last few times we've been marching under a big banner that says fossils against fossil fuels. So there you are. Um, let us do what we can, not only to slow climate change, but to take on the most disgusting and unnecessary public health emergency on the face of our planet. Thank you. Thank you, Bill. Um, Bill said nine million people died due to the uh, products of fossil fuel usage. And he also said it is the poor uh, and working class globally that uh, disproportion are disproportionately burdened by the effects of climate change. There is no reason to use coal. There is no reason to use fossil fuels that harm the environment and harm the people. So. There is no place for profit in tackling climate change. Do you all agree? Yeah. Do you all agree? Yeah. Yeah. Awesome. Thank you. So now I will move on to our next speaker, Tanetta Hill Mohammed. They are a Chicago chapter organizer for BYP 100 and an organizer for Scholars for Social Justice. Their work is rooted in black, queer, feminist, and abolitionist organizing, transformative health education initiatives, and transnational movement spaces. Tanetta truly believes in the power of people's narratives in creating an organizing vision for the future. Tanetta teaches Stop the Bleed and Street Medic trainings and works on multiple campaigns across the city. Inspired by collective power and popular education practices, they constantly strive to be accountable to themselves and their community. Please welcome Tanetta. Thank you so much. And thank you to all of the panelists here and the people who are here as well. Um, I'd like to so, show some appreciation to my comrades and friends in the audience for being here to support me. Um, community care is borderless. So 
when I think about the work that I do as a street medic, as a person who teaches Stop the Bleed, I'm constantly imagining how I can make community care accessible for all people um, with the understanding that health and wellness is deeper than going to a hospital. Um, health and wellness is deeper than having access to a clinic or even having a universal health care system, right? It is embedded in the fact that all people must have some form of training um, and medical care access and the necessary tools in order to enact that change on their environments. And when we study health, it has to be done in a way that looks at the complete life experience of people and of a person. Because health outcomes are affected by our environment, both the built and otherwise. Um, transportation must be accessible. Mental health uh, clinics must be accessible. Um, and our understanding of mental health must be treated with as much, much fever as we treat physical ailments. Um, something that I, I, thank you, something I really want people to take away today is that none of this happens without recognizing that black and indigenous people suffer the most through the denial of universal health care and health as a right. And that's not just here in America, um, because we know that the the macro is informed by the micro, just as much as the micro is a, is a reflection of the macro, right? Um, so our communities exist in a way where they're, in, I, live in, I live in Chicago, to be specific. In Chicago, there's a 30-year age um, life expectancy gap um, between the west side and downtown, um, that downtown area being Streeterville. So a couple blocks, determines where you grow up, determines on your life expectancy and your ability to access care. In Chicago, there is access to one level four trauma center on the entirety of the south side of Chicago. And these healthcare outcomes are not just things um, that affect black and indigenous folks um, um, who are cishet, right? But also people who are queer, black and indigenous queer folks exponentially more, right, exponentially more, because black and, black and indigenous queer folks are often disbarred from being able to receive gender affirming care and care that recognizes them in their humanity. So I exist as an organizer within BYP 100, Black Youth Project 100, and B <laughs> BYP 100 um, is a youth organizing um, organization for people between the ages of 18 and 35. We organize under a black, queer, feminist, and abolitionist lens. And abolitionist medicine recognizes that there is, there is, me there is a medicine practice that already exists in our society, and that medical practice is stratified, that medical practice is racist, is sexist, is homophobic, and inaccessible. But abolitionist medicine says that we want to create something new. And I live, I live in that praxis. Um, I live in the praxis of, of recognizing that through abolitionist medicine, through my per personal praxis, I'll be able to transform community. Thank you. Thank you so much, Tanetta. Um, like they said, transportation must be accessible. Mental health must be accessible. To have a 30-year um, age gap in life expectancy across class divides is not normal. It is an unnatural system, and we must be empowered to fight and change the system that puts people over profit. So for our next speaker, I would like to introduce Carlos Mariquin who is an activist and community leader in Los Angeles. He is the National Director of Food for Health Programs, a board member of Urban Partners Los Angeles, and a member for Healthcare for All Los Angeles. He works to strengthen poor and working class communities by expanding food and education programs. He founded Occupy Fight Foreclosures, and he was the lead organizer of the Bernie Sanders Brigade. Please welcome Carlos. Thank you. Thank you. Uh, it is an honor to be here amongst the panelists 
And I would like to th say thank you to the organizers of this summit for their hard work, dedication, and, and everything they're doing to uh, give voice uh, to these issues that are very important to all of us. Thank you so much for your, for your work. I'd like to acknowledge our brothers and sisters in the, in the audience, many familiar faces. Thank you for being here. Thank you for standing up. Thank you for being informed. Thank you for educating yourselves and thank you for carrying on the torch because I know that most of you out there are working very hard on these issues that we care about. People over profit, health as a human right across the world. I would like to connect this to food insecurity, an issue that, that pretty much affects hundreds, hundreds of millions of people globally. It is serious. It affects the health of individuals. People die because lack of access to healthy food. It's very real and it's only getting worse. Food insecure refers to the situation that exists when people at all times don't have physical, social, economic access to sufficient, safe, nutritious food that meets their dietary needs and food preferences for an active and healthy life. That is what pretty much, in a nutshell, what food insecurity is. Lack of access to healthy food. There are many reasons or causes that have created this lack of access. I'll give you some for example. Lack of access for farming lands, land grabbing, conflict, violence, wars, unfair trade rules, natural disasters, climate change, wastage of food, food being wasted, market dominance by corporate giants, bad policies, and perhaps the biggest one, greed. There is a reason why we have one of the richest men in the world owning most of the farm in the United States, Bill Gates. That tells you a lot. It's about control. It's about having dominion. It's about profiting of the very basic human right that people have, healthy food. Food, should, food is a right. Everyone should be entitled to have healthy food. We learn a lot through the pandemic. There's a lot that we learn. We saw firsthand here in Los Angeles how people got directly affected by the lack of access to, to food during the pandemic. But that, that in itself was something that, that already existed but it was uncovered with the pandemic. People were already struggling to have access to healthy food. Everywhere that you look around, whether you realize it or not, there are food deserts. There are countries themselves are a food desert, entire countries. So this is very serious when we talk about food insecurity, the control of food, and the lack of access to our communities. The most impacted on food insecurity are yes, you guessed it right, the poor, communities of color. That's who are the most affected by food insecurity. People, plain and simple, don't have money to buy food. The economics, and who are the ones that are often struggling the most to be able to, you know, put food on the table are communities of color, indigenous people. 
So let's understand that it is no mistake that 820 million people face hunger in the world. Here in the United States, 38 million people go to sleep hungry. 12 million are children. In California, 8 million face food insecurity. L.A. County, 2 million people. 2 million people, L.A. County alone. This is by design, people, because as I travel to and fro different states and looking at the issues and, and, and talking to people on the ground, I can tell you one thing. We all are in the same boat, and the people that are profiting by the food are, are doing it, whether it's in Puerto Rico, whether it's in New York, whether it's in Chicago and Tennessee, where, you know, every single state is being affected by this. And again, the margins of profit continues to grow. So I like to uh, end up with this because everything seems to be negative when it comes to food. And by the way, we know that if we don't eat well, we develop illnesses. It's, that's, that's just the plain truth. You don't eat well, you don't eat at all, you could die. So let's, 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 I want to leave a tone here, a positive tone. Because during the pandemic, what I saw, during the failure of the government to protect the people, I saw people rising up. I saw mutual aid. I saw people organizing, mobilizing. I saw people driving, cooking, and taking meals to those folks that didn't have any. And if we are going to overcome anything, it's when we come together. Thank you. Carlos, um, food insecurity is such a tragic reality in so many of our communities, especially in the richest country in the world that priorita prioritizes economic profit over the well-being of communities. <laughs> Having access to healthy food is a health care issue or is a health issue. And from what you have heard, it is clear that there is an urgent need for us to stand up and fight back against the system. Are you all ready to fight? Yeah. Yes. Great. So this brings me to our last panelist, Dr. Bita Amani. Dr. Amani is a social epidemiologist focusing on the relationship between health and politics. She investigates how state-sanctioned divestment and violence perpetuates racial inequ inequity through public health crisis and how public health can maintain a system of white supremacy. She prioritizes health-promoting solutions, such as the Cuban health model, and supports partnerships with grassroots organizations like Stop LAPD Spine Coalition and Youth Justice Coalition. She is also an associate professor at Charles R. Drew University, leads the UCLA CDU COVID-19 Racism and Equity Task Force, and co-directs Charles R. Drew University's Black Maternal Health Center of Excellence. Please welcome Dr. Amani. Good afternoon, everyone. Um, it is such an honor to be here today. I want to thank the organizers for inviting me. I want to thank these lovely, brilliant panelists for laying the ground for my remarks. And of course, I want to thank Samina um, for all of her support and as well as um, keeping these issues connected. Um, the remarks that I've prepared today are all about the connections, the connections that the panelists have already made for you, um, as well as a discussion about the traps, right? The reforms that we find ourselves in that are trying to deceive us um, and paint this illusion that somehow, for example, concepts such as DEI, diversity, equity, inclusion, are the anti-racist like efforts that we need to be supporting in order to move our quest for liberation forward. Um, my gratitude today extends to the team that Samina outlined in my bio, the task force, as well as the Black Maternal Health Center of Excellence that has kept me grounded and vigilant when it comes to prioritizing activities 
that dig deeper into the core of pandemic response and management. This work that I'm presenting today is built on decades of partnerships and analysis of what public health is and the ways it can serve the interests of the people that are mobilizing against multiple levels, layers, and intersections of oppression. I have prepared these remarks today based on um, demands of local social movements here in Los Angeles, as well as those across the Americas, to decriminalize poverty, mental illness, and addiction, as well as to look at alternative systems, such as a Cuban health system, that obviously um, are a solution that is much more universal, integrated, comprehensive, holistic, biopsychosocial, socio-ecological than the one that we have today. I can't start this conversation about talking about health and profits without talking about our work in Cuba and recognizing not only the many wonderful activists outside this hall who are continuously pushing for us being able to get, to get resources to Cuba, such as resources to rebuild anesthesia machines or to get sutures, you know, as well as those who are in Cuba who have welcomed us for you know, several years now to be able to come and to study how is it that they had a public health revolution right, in Cuba and in that public health re um, revolution dissolved the existing social order, rebuilt one, and made a system that is all about prioritizing not only human beings, but communicating to them that they are not disposable, right? One of which is obviously um, in contradiction with the one that the panelists have you know, described here today. Um, I need to talk about um, Catherine Hall Trujillo of Birthing Project USA. Right, who has been my partner in, um, when it comes to taking public health students, doctors, physicians, pharmacists to Cuba. Um, as I've already mentioned, there's many reasons why we would want to go to Cuba um, to study, the least of which, um, I mean, um, one, a very important one of which is the internationalism. So its commitment not only to the health of the Cuban people, but its commitment to the health of everyone um, globally. Um, but we also go because, as Catherine Hall Trujillo is often known for saying, Cuba is one of the safest places on the planet for a black baby to be born. Now you contrast that with here in the United States, right, where um, um, black women and infants are three to five times more likely to die from preventable conditions and the direct result of a system of white supremacy, capitalism, and heteronormative patriarchy, um, which instead of prioritizing the um, tremendous gift that the womb has, right, and brings to the earth, instead instated a model that criminalizes and medicalizes um, you know, reproductive health. So, in contrast, when we're talking about the Cuban health model, so contrasting it to the United States, this country with all of its resources, right, sees approximately 10 deaths for every 1,000 black babies that are born, right? Um, it's maternal child health statistics um, compared to other first world nations, definitely has it um, in the lowest rankings. Um, and you know, once again, when we compare it with a model like Cuba, right, under um, economic distress, right, decades of sanctions that not only sees infant mortality rates much lower, right, contrasting it with that, where it's also one of the nations that is the nation that was the first in the world to eliminate the transmission of HIV from mother to child, right? These types of statistics, right, these global victories, they highlight to us what do we actually need in order to build the system instead of us focusing on looking for private industry and looking for tech, right, in order to um, um, think through the problems that we have today. The remarks that I have right now in front of me that I have only five more minutes um, to give, right, the remarks that I have in front of me um, that are um, extremely important that I want to make sure that I um, communicate um, before I leave today is how, as my partner Stop LAPD Spying Co um, Coalition is um, known for saying, that this crisis that we find ourselves in today is not a moment in time, but instead a continuation of history. And some of the things that we have to add to this conversation about health and human rights when we're talking about crises is that crises are not foregone conclusions. They are not inevitable. They are not random. 
And the number one predictor of how bad they will be is how much injustice existed before they even started. Just as we are now more comfortable with calling this racial system by its name, identifying it as a system of white supremacy, we too must connect and see how this system of white supremacy has globally impacted the hierarchies across nations and limited what is possible within them. In other words, to familiarize ourselves within this fight for health with the impact of the glo current global configuration of power and dominance is, right, is the reason why we find ourselves without access to a universal comprehensive holistic uh, um, health system here in the United States. What impact does having, what, what impact does this have on preventing death and disability within the United States? And how does this impact the ability for other nations to secure and manage health-related resources for their own people? When we talk about missing connections, these points here are grossly underappreciated in our fights for health. And these missing connections are structurally produced. There is a work group that organizes out of the American Public Health Association, the Peace Caucus, and for years they have been discussing what it would mean if we push for a prevention of war within public health, and to think about what is needed to prevent these conditions from existing or worsening. They too have thought about what it means to bring a public health model to the issue of state-sanctioned violence in the form of war. In an anthology they published, they published the work of Dr. Bernard Lowen, a Nobel Peace Prize recipient and co-founder of Physicians for Social Re um, Responsibility, who in their work in 2011 found that out of the top 20 ranked public health schools in the nation, only 2%, 2% of all the coursework covered was about war or war-related topics. And only four of them could be uh, understood as actually advancing the discourse on preventing war. Now, there are many reasons why we should think through what does it mean to medicalize or to frame an issue as a public health crisis with many traps, right, in doing that. After all, public health is a set of tools and it's a stool of the tools of the state right, intended to maintain and manage state interests, but it is quite remarkable that when we're talking about climate justice, when we're talking about access to nutrition, when we're talking about appreciating the roles of addiction, criminalization, mental health, when we're in a moment where we're talking about abolition, that we would think to not talk about militarism, imperialism, and its relationship to anti-Muslim racism and anti-black racism and all the conditions that we find ourselves here in the United States. It makes, us, it makes me suspicious of where we're going, right? And it makes me also think that DEI, as I'm sure many of my colleagues here on this panel would agree, is nothing more than remanaging in this country who has been tagged as necessary and who has been tagged as once again disposable. The last example that I want to leave that I think um, is very important um, in talking about healthcare and healthcare profits is a, is a story uh, about how we have come to have a hospital-based system here in the United States, and in particular, a hospital-based system that is in charge of our reproductive health. Through major shifts in medical education and um, through ma major shifts in medical, um, ed um, medical education and hospital administration, Power has been shifted from a community health model like the one we see in Cuba today to one that is hospital-based and has been governed by white men. Once again, this was a workforce that was trained and intent on serving a hospital-based model of care and not a community-based one. The transfer of care when it comes to reproductive health from a black and indigenous midwifery model to elite white men who either themselves were settlers, right, or we're actively enslaving other people or directly benefiting from the enslavement of other people is one of the reasons why we are struggling in our fights to be able to get health as a human right here in the United States. That erasure of the community uh, midwifery workforce, and I wanna be very clear, I'm talking about the black and brown community wor uh, workforce, and the movement of thinking about birth as a disease, right, is at the root of many of the problems and across all the issues here today, right? 
Um, and I see that I think um, my time is up, and so I just want to end here um, with one last um, comment. It is the last comment. Um, and that the other connection that's really important that we make is that what tools are being, or what policies are being instituted under the name of public health that continue to be to our detriment. And one of these examples is Title 42, a public health law that the Trump administration put into effect just seven days after the pandemic was announced that has, over, has had collateral consequences for people at the border and resulted in um, per, you know, further exacerbating um, um, death, disability, and management both in Mexico and um, as well as the United States. Um, thank you. Thank you, Dr. Amani. So from what you all have heard today, it is clear that health isn't just a single issue. It is connected to climate change. It is connected to a capitalism exploitation of black and brown and indigenous communities. And the need for universal health care is uh, more urgent than ever. A new and better system is possible. The solutions to our problem have already been implemented in countries like Cuba despite decades-long uh, murderous blockade. So the time is now for us to implement these solutions and reclaim the system that uh, instead of putting profit over people, we fight and change the system that puts people over profit. So before we end the panel, I would like to extend a question to all of the panelists. Um, it's a very general question, so maybe we can start with Dr. Amani, and we can go down. So given that this panel is titled People Over Profit, and we all want a system that prioritizes our health and well-being, what do you think is the biggest opportunity in this current moment when it comes to building an alternative to the capitalist model? I think one of the most exciting things that I've heard um, you know, in the panel that was you know, before ours today that I think is directly related to what we're doing um, here right now and to answer your question, Samina, is the need to internationalize the struggle for health as a human right in the United States. And it might be a time to think about what does it mean to, for example, if we think about Cuba, right, and the importance of sending doctors and health professionals all around the world, not only to be able to support those causes, but to learn from, right, what does it mean to um, prepare a workforce in other disaster contexts. It might be the time that we also send our own professionals other places, right, and connect and internationalize our movements um, so that we can see how others are doing it um, instead of struggling so much here in this country, looking to you know private industry and to tech in order to give us solutions that are ultimately not going to do anything but reform the current system we have. Thank you, Dr. Amani. We can go to Sanetta next. Can you restate the question? Yes. So um, I was. Uh, the question is, what do you think is the biggest opportunity in this current moment when it comes to building an alternative to the capitalist model? Thank you. Um, I think as an organizer, the biggest opportunity is in building our desire to organize. Um, we, organizing is fundamental to our ability to mobilize and galvanize people towards this understanding that health is a human right, right? We have to move out of this idea of industrialization and militarization over the investment and wellness of people. And doing so under the lens that BYP 100 has, the black, queer, feminist, and abolitionist lens, makes it clear that there is no, there is no um, economic, health, political, or moral justice without racial justice, right? Um, there, that it does not exist when we do not tackle the issue of black and queer and marginalized people. Um, our health is political. Our health, our healthcare outcomes are political, and capital is typically the greatest indicator of our ability to access healthcare. How do we change these models? And I, I feel like to this question, I would be remiss without talking about um, our contemporaries. Um, there are the modern EMT system um, that exists today was created because of the Freedom House Ambulance Service mm -hmm. out of Pittsburgh in 1967. If it wasn't for that creation, um, EMTs in their current 
existence would not have existed. And it is because black people decided to come together in a form of mutual aid, in a form of community care, um, in a model that said, um, we want to create an alternative model that doesn't put our people in the back of police cars in order to get them to the hospital, that said, okay, th this is how we are going to um, take care of one another. So our models are created when we organize, we recognize that community care and our collective um, path towards liberation is possible. And then we send our ideas and our understandings and our education forth. And it's not, it's not enough to hypothesize. It's not enough to read and to be in conversations like this. The reason why the biggest takeaway is organizing is because organizing is the work. It is the gears, the engine, and the wheels that push people towards their lived reality. Um, so. <laughs> Um, we know that privatization exacerbates inequalities. Um, it means that there are the haves and the have-nots. And in the historical context, that typically looks like those were proximity to whiteness and heteronormativity. Um, by having an intersectional lens and making sure our lens um, exists not just in a cis um, white male understanding of the world, we recognize that affirming care for queer people, especially black queer people, and an understanding of access to abortions is that is often touted as an issue for cishet women, but for birthing people, all birthing people, is disproportionately going going to allow is going to allow black and brown folks the opportunity to get access to the care that they need and completely change our current health model that we have. Um, access for black and brown queer folks is going to change the way we exist and um, have our ability to have sovereignty and, ac and access to our right to do the things that we need to do with our body. Thank you. We know that things are, are bad and perhaps will get much worse. The biggest opportunities that we have right now with those challenges that we are facing is the opportunity of embracing one another, of coming together, of supporting each other, educating ourselves, as I said before, educating, organizing to mobilize. When we're talking about food insecurity, we know that there are options. We cannot wait on the government that will kill us, that will allow us to die. We wait all day long for them to bring us food. We have to start learning to grow our own food. We have to learn to do urban farming you know, we got to work with each other. We got to call to one another. That's one of the things that, that really brought a lot of strength to the movement here in Los Angeles during the pandemic, because we were talking to one another. If an organization in South Central had a need, we were there making sure that they had resources. If they were out there in the valley and they were lacking whatever, we make sure that we connected them to resources. That's what we do, people. That's the biggest opportunity we have right now is to strengthen ourselves, to work together, to stop fighting each other or competing with each other. And I hope that that's not the case because we thrive when we come together. We really do. So I do want to take a moment to recognize the irony that the one country that in this hemisphere that could have shown us how to do healthcare as a human right has been banned from coming to this summit. Uh, it's really too bad that we don't have our Cuban brothers and sisters here on this panel to show us how to do it, right? Um, instead, we, we, we have to... Um, well, we have people that go, go to Cuba and, and learn about it, which is great. Um, being a physician trained in the Western biomedical 
model, I, I have to say that not only is, is health political, but medicine is political as well. And it's something that we really need to recognize because that's sort of the mindset that, that, that we, we have. Um, the, the way that medicine is, is practiced today is very political. The, the, the reasons we don't have a universal national health program is, is very political, and that's what we need to fight against. And then finally, so you know, when, you, when you're sort of at the end of, of, of the line here, <laughs> everything has already been said about opportunity, although I'm waiting for Bill to come up you know, um, with, with the last great word. Um, I, I think that, I'll, I'll say this again, I think that this is a winnable fight. Uh, we have to be strategic. Um, we have to choose our battles, but um, the, the fight that I see is, is, is the privatization of our healthcare system. I just talked about Medicare, but everything is being privatized through private equity that, that are owning our nursing homes, that are owning um, our dialysis centers. Uh, everything is being privatized, and, and I really do see that as being a battle, but it's, I, I also think that if we're strategic about it, uh, and we come together, that, it's, that it is a winnable fight. And that's, that's sort of what I want to leave you with. Thank you. Thank you, Dr. Malino. And, and, and I'm really the wrong person to end here because I'm not very good at thinking through things theoretically. And truthfully, taking on capitalism scares me because it's big and powerful. And the main thing I've been able to figure out over the years is that the thing that they really care about is money. So you try to take it away from them. And one way to do that that could really change things, not all things, but a lot of things, power balances pretty fast, is the ability now to go directly after the fossil fuel industry, which is the biggest single industry on our planet. Um, since we now can provide power more cheaply with the sun and the wind, that's an interesting thing. Think about fossil fuel, coal, gas, oil. It only exists in a few places on Earth, so the people who happen to sit on top of those places end up with lots of money and lots of power. That's the Koch brothers, our biggest oil and gas barons in this country who deformed our government. That's the king of Saudi Arabia or Vladimir Putin or on and on and on, a lot of people. That's Exxon. Well, if we quickly move to renewable energy, their business is gone, okay? Because, yeah, there'll be some people who get rich putting up solar panels, but not Exxon rich, because once you've put the thing up, every morning, the sun rises above the horizon and delivers your energy for free. Why do you think Exxon hates it so much, okay? Because that's, to them, the stupidest business model on Earth, because they want you to write a check every day till the end of time. So the point is, this is one very practical way to put a much more small d democracy at work in, because because the sun is not like coal and gas and oil, the sun is everywhere. And actually, if you think about it, there's more of it when you get towards the equator than there is when you get to the north. So there's a lot of good things to be said about a world where we start taking away the money of some of the richest and most irresponsible people on the planet. I, I don't know if it ends capitalism, but it gets us in that direction in a big and real way. So that's why I like doing it. So thank you. Thank you. So before we go to some concluding remarks, I would like to ask Dr. Amani to share an announcement. Um, I just, you know, if, in case I was not um, uh, clear during the talk, there is a fundraiser, right, in order to be able to address the issues of the 
of the blockade, right, the sanctions against Cuba, um, to be able to um, get them um, the supplies that they need um, so that they're, be, they're able to handle um, trauma-related um, you know, illnesses. So I just really want to encourage you um, to step outside and to be able to you know, um, look for the flyers um, as well as um, to think about joining the fundraiser um, next weekend. Thank you, Dr. Amani, and thank you to um, all the incredible speakers today. Thank you all for being such a great audience. We all just heard that a better system is possible, and we saw the evidence in what Dr. in the evidence and in what Dr. Ramos had shared. It is now up to us to unite and reclaim our health as a human right from the hands of privatization. Even though capitalism is powerful now, it is only a matter of time that it won't be. When we fight, we win. Can everyone repeat after me? When we fight, we, we win. win. When we, we fight, 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 we win. win. When we fight, we win. Thank you, everyone. Can you some stuff about this Medicare stuff? Yeah. Because if you're organizing what you're doing with older people, that'll be fun too. Oh, yeah. It would be really fun. I mean,